In the last class, we looked at uh, William Miller's rule number five. Remember? Sister Dorcas, could you uh, explain rule number five for us, please? Every word has its... It doesn't say every word has its... Shall, we, shall, I read the, shall I read the rule to you? I'll read it to you. Scripture must be its own expositor, since it is a rule of itself. So, what, did that, what does that mean for you? Anything else? What about the bit of the rule? It says it is a rule of itself. So the rule of itself means it can explain itself. Yeah? My brother with the white shirt. Why? Why can't you use another book to explain it? So, the Bible must explain itself because it's the only guaranteed source that you know that it follows its own rules from one portion of inspiration to another portion or from one book of the Bible to another. They are allowed to explain themselves because we know they use a consistent rule. If you went to an outside source, an external book, what would be the problem? What's the problem if you use an external or outside source, my sister? So you might come with another theory or another rule. And that's what the problem is. The rule teaches that the only safe rule is the rules that govern the Bible because they're internally consistent. And if you use some other methodology or other rule from some other source, it's not reliable. It doesn't say another book or another source. It says a teacher. Don't go to another teacher who's using, using what? Using different, using different rules. What are the rules in the example that's given that these teachers using, these three of them? Guesswork. Second one? A sectarian creed or a personal opinion. So it's ignorance or a certain opinion, and the third one? Showing off, or we might call it pride or gadal. They want to make a name for themselves, and that's why they're going to explain something. So you can't trust any of those three things. Does that mean you should never go to a teacher? No. Who are the reliable teachers? So those who use the 
principles and rules from the Bible, they're safe guides or safe teachers. We might call them those first, second and third angel messengers. We might call them ambassadors. We may call them prophets. We may call them priests. They come under different symbols, but it's those people who are following these rules. All that, is all that okay? Make sense? So, part of the problem is who are these people that are following these rules that you can trust, these guides or these counsellors? When you take the biblical stories, sometimes they're clear. So, would Moses be a safe teacher? Would he fit, would he fit into this bad teacher or good teacher role? Moses. Good teacher or bad teacher? Good teacher or bad teacher? So some, someone, one, some people said bad, one person said bad, and the rest of us are saying good. So I guess we could ask ourselves, if he's 35 years old, is he a good teacher or a bad teacher? Good or bad? It's bad if he's 35 years old. If he's 85 years old, is he a good or bad teacher? It's good. So obviously he's not improved with age. That's not the point we're trying to make, because if he's 120 years old, is he a good or bad teacher? He's a bad teacher now. So it's all about the time period in which you live, or we might call the dispensation in which you live, that makes someone safe or unsafe. So Paul, was he safe or not very safe? Is he a good guy or bad guy? Depends. That one's a bit easier because he comes under two names, Saul and Paul. So it's easy to divide between the two. So when we come to our history, not our history, we'll go to another one. Is Miller, following Miller's rules, is he a safe teacher? In 1818, is he a safe teacher? Yes. Yeah? Yes. So, is he guessing? No. Uh, is he showing off? No. Does he have sectarian creed? <laughs> Does he have a sectarian creed, my elder at the back? In 1818, does he have a sectarian creed? He says in 25 years, what's going to happen? The him answer. Good. What is he saying in 1818? What are his words? What are his words in 1818? What does he say? We'll do it here. We're in eighteen eighteen. And what's his words? In twenty five years, eighteen forty three, what's going to happen? You're not sure of the answer? What's he, he says, in 25 years, what's going to happen? Sorry? My sister. He says, in 25 years, it's going to be the second advent. Where did he get that from? From his sectarian creed. But the problem is, is it sectarian? What does sectarian mean? Someone, 
someone thought uh, I can say a belief that she has sectarian comes from the word sect but you're not incorrect sectarian Good. So if we say sectarian sect and say sector, I'm not saying that's the correct word usage, but we'll just play on words. A certain sector of Christianity. Now, the thing is, it's not just a certain sector. Everyone believes that. Whatever sector or sect you're from, all those Christians believe this. That's why it's hard to discern. Did you have your hand up? So it's not easy for people to pick up because... It's not one group are saying, oh, um, this is just our sex view, sect, um, and the other one had a different one. Everyone believes the same thing. So it becomes difficult to have this sectarian concept here. But he picked this up from the church and it's wrong. So is he a safe guide? It's not, is he? He's not using, he's not even following his own rule to do this. The Bible is not the expositor. He's actually got what, according to his own rule, a sectarian perspective of what's about to happen. So he's already made his message muddy or difficult. Did you have a comment? You agree? We all agree with that? So, he's the first angel's message. And he's got this sectarian view you go back 1800 years and what do we discover? My sister? Sarah. What did we discover 1800 years before Miller came on the scene? Miller's the first angel's message. Who are we speaking about? 1800 years before. First angel's message. Messenger. Which history are we in if we go back 1800 years? Which reform line? Give you a choice. We already spoke about Moses and we already spoke about Miller. Which other line do we speak about? The line of Christ? Okay, who's the first angel's messenger? John. John is the first angel's messenger. Does he have a problem? What's his problem? Does he show off? Does he guess? Does he have a sectarian creed? What is his perspective that he picked up from his creed? What does he believe? Do you know? I can't hear you. Everyone believes Christ is going to come, but it's a bit more than just believing Christ is going to come. It's a little bit more than that. It's the details of what, what's going to happen when Christ comes. The sister behind you. What's he believing? One second. Start again. So John the Baptist, he's got a sectarian view that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come as a conquering king. Is that a sectarian perspective? For certain it is. Does that make him a safe guide? No, it doesn't. So the problem is, now we have what we would probably call 
I don't know if you would use the word pucker or real, genuine, top quality prophet who has got a sectarian view and we've also got perhaps what we might think is a second tier or second rate or second quality prophet, Miller, who's not actually a prophet most people would think, who also has a sectarian view. So whether you're a real prophet, if I can say it this way, or a pretend prophet like Miller, not a genuine prophet, that's how most people would consider him, it doesn't make any difference because both will have sectarian views. So what are we beginning to discover when we think about reform lines? What's a problem that we have to deal with? Before you answer that, let me put one more piece of information into the mix. Was John sent by God? Yes. Was Miller sent by God? Yes. yes. So they're ambassadors. So if they're ambassadors, we could call them angels or messengers. So they're not just teachers or just normal people. So an ambassador speaks for the king. Isn't that what the definition of a prophet is? When the prophet speaks, that's the voice of God. But now we discover a problem. The problem is part of their message is not speaking for God, is it? It's speaking for their creed. And we know that out of those three characteristics, both men have the same problem. It's not pride and it's not ignorance or what does the rule say? Guesswork. It's always, on those two examples, it's always holding a sectarian view. And we're going to change the word sectarian view to see, or to say, the church's view, which is why it's so difficult. Did John just hold a view that a certain narrow select group of Jews held? No. It was a common idea that the Messiah that was going to come was going to be a king and everybody thought that it was widely understood. So that's the reason why it's hard to identify this sectarian issue. When he says it in the rule, it's easy to see because your choice is, are you going to take a Catholic perspective or a Protestant perspective? Which sect? A Baptist perspective or a Presbyterian perspective? Which sect? It's easy to do that when you have uh, denominational views. But when you don't have that, when you have something like the Jewish church or the Protestant churches of America, which are just essentially a singular entity, it becomes difficult to actually apply this rule in its proper way because you can't identify the sectarian part of that. Can we see that? So that's why so many people get deceived get duped or conned into this belief because they say everyone believes it, therefore it must be so. So we've discussed John, we've discussed Miller, we mentioned Moses. Moses wasn't safe at the beginning. Why is he not safe? Put your hand up. Why is he not safe? He has a sectarian creed, a sectarian perspective. Is he guessing? No. Does he have pride? We'll give him the license to say he's not a proud man, even though he does have, you can see pride in his uh, demeanour, in his behaviour. He's a prince. All princes have some level of pride. So he has a sectarian view. My brother, what's his sectarian view? What's Moses' sectarian view that makes him an unsafe teacher? So his idea is God's going to deliver the Egyptians by force of arms. So that's one problem he's got. He's got another problem as well. 
What's his other problem? Uh, now, before you answer that one, so he has this problem that he's going to use force of arms. Where did he get that idea from? Did you read about it? Where did he get that idea from? Brother Rogers? So he made it up. We'll say it that way. He makes that up. He's got a military background and he says, I had an increase of knowledge from whom? Who trained him? No. His mother. His mother trained him. Is that what you're going to say? His mother trained him. And what did she say? God has prepared you for this work. She doesn't know all the details. She just says, this work. And she doesn't know when, but she's training him to do what? To go where? To go into Pharaoh's house. And she said, when you get there, they will train you to do what? To do your... To do your job function, do your work. That's what they're going to train you to do. What are they training to be? A military leader. So he's getting all of this from his mother, but he's making it up. If we're okay with that. He has another problem. So he's got this sectarian view that he's going to take over and defeat the Egyptians by military force. So he made that one up because he doesn't understand what his training looks like. So if we just think about that, I'm not going to say we're going to discuss it in class. Think that he doesn't even understand what his training looks like, what the actual training is. Because he thinks he's being trained for one thing and at the same time he's actually being trained, because he's being trained both by his mother and by Pharaoh, to do something else, isn't he? But he misunderstands what the true training is that he's supposed to be receiving. Because he received both, he received, the, he received the true training, otherwise he couldn't have done his job, could he? Couldn't have been ploughed, couldn't have had a, a former reign, inclusive knowledge. He had to have all of that. But there's another problem that he has. This one's worse. So that he's misled by? What's his wife's name? Zipporah. That one. Before that. Before that. Someone else. Put your hand up. He's got a big problem. Okay, I'll give you some clues. Does he know who he is? We all agree with that. Do you agree with that, my sister? Does he know who he is? How does he know who he is? Two answers, please. How does he know who he is? He's told by his mother. What I'm going to say is he has an internal witness. At least his mother does. And his mother gave him that internal witness. So we'll call that a feeling if you're okay to do that. His mother had an awareness that this baby is special compared to all the other babies. She has the, I'll say feeling, we could say the Holy Spirit gave her that instruction or that guidance. She has an awareness and she gave that onto him. So number one, he has a personal internal feeling, awareness that he's special. Number two, how else does he know who he is? Not sure? Okay, someone put their hand up. My sister? <laughs> so, I don't know if everybody heard that. He looks like an Israelite. So when he compares himself to the Egyptians, he says, I don't look like them, I look like... So this is not aimed at you, don't take it personally, but I don't know if we've watched movies on this subject, because in the movies, 
He doesn't know who he is. He comes to 40 and someone says, oh, by the way, no one told you, but you're an Israelite. The real story is what? When you're 40, do you remember what you were doing when you were 12? Of course you do. You might not remember when you were 12 months, but you know what you were when you were 12 years and 11 and 10. He already knew he was an Israelite. So he doesn't discover that then like it's some surprise. He's been planning and scheming for 28 years. If you go right back to his birth, he's been planning for a long time. No, 28 years since he's 12. That what he's, what he's going to do. So it's not new. He's just waiting. We call it biding his time. He's got a second problem. So that's the, we'll leave the mother, I want something else more specific. One second. No. <laughs> Sister Emma? Okay. Stop that. I can't hear you. Okay, there's all of that, but there's something more fundamental. Like some communication. This is before that. He's 80 then. We're talking about when he's in his 30s or 40s. His name. His name? Okay, we can go with his name. You'll give me the answer first, not the preamble. That's why I stopped you. <laughs> not the training. No, he has not married yet. The question is, he makes a mistake about how he's going to deliver the people, which is through his training. But he has a, even, he's made a bigger mistake because there's a big problem. He should know what to do. He has clear evidence that he should know what to do. Not that. It's the same point. Okay, I'll give you the clue then. <laughs> Moses means to draw out. We, we, we may do that, we may not. What number is he? Four. Four. So what's his problem? What do you mean by number four? <laughs> He's going to explain to us. Because he said, if I say number, if I give a, a silly question, and someone answers, then, I, then the person and I know what we're talking about. So instead of me giving the answer, he'll give the answer of what he meant. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? So Abraham is given a prophecy that it's in the fourth generation that his descendants are going to receive deliverance. One second. That's enough for the moment. Now you know what four is? So you already know that? Yeah? yeah. So we just reminded you. Okay, so there's a prophecy that Abraham has about the number four. And what is the prophecy? We won't worry about the timing of it, the time prophecy. It's 400, 430 years, depending on how you calculate. What does the prophecy say? Sorry? Not just that. What does deliverance look like? What does deliverance look like? Sorry? Not that. Let me ask a different question. Where do you live? Answer the question, where do you live? You live in Egypt. You're going to have what? You're going to have a war, where? 
We would call that civil war. Even though it's two nations. Because not really a nation, they're just slaves in that nation. Once you defeat all the Egyptians and the royal family, where are you going to live? Where are you going to live? You're going to live in Egypt. If you were going to live in Canaan, what would you do? You would escape, you wouldn't, you wouldn't fight. So the fact that he's fighting, we could argue it's through his training, but he should have had all the information, in fact he has all the information, to know that that is the wrong way to approach it. Because if you fight, the only reason you fight with a royal household is because you want, you want their house, you want to take over their house which means you want to live in their house. And he already knows the prophecy says what? You're supposed to have your own place, which is Canaan. You've already got your house over there. So can we see? He's without excuse. It all seems okay that, you know, it's his training, it's not his fault. We can be gentle on him. But the prophecy says, regardless of the timing, the prophecy says that your home is in Canaan. And to provoke civil war means that you want to stay in Egypt. We okay with that? Yeah. yeah? Shows you how easy it is to abuse and manipulate prophecy. That's why I'm saying it's far worse the criminality that Moses is doing. He's without excuse because you don't have to even you don't even have to uh, dig for treasure do you on that one? What's the promise to Abraham? We're going to give you this land, the one that you're standing on. Everyone knows that. It's easy to know. You don't have, there's no hidden treasure in there. And Moses ignores that. Okay, so we've done Moses. We've done John. And we have done Miller. So if you've seen a recent presentation on that subject, you can connect a common theme through all of those three dispensations. So if anybody's watched those presentations, if you agree with that conclusion, what's the one concept that connects all three? No one watches my presentations. <laughs> what's Moses' problem? Egypt or Canaan? So he's got a problem on what? Geography. Geography. You go to John. What's his problem? Is it the heart or heaven or Israel? He's got a problem on geography because he wants to do what? What does John want to do? The Messiah's coming and when he comes, what's he going to do? He's going to destroy? Where? In Israel. Which is, what kind of a war? Civil war. Because they're the slaves, the Romans and the Mars, it's exactly the same situation that Moses has. It's identical. He wants civil war. We kick out the Romans and we take their house, the Roman garrison, if you like. So it's problem of geography. Miller, it's an easy one. Problem of geography is sanctuary. We're all okay with that. Every single one of those three stories is also connected by another common theme. Subject of time. You can easily see that, yes? So we have 400, 430 years. Then uh, John has what? 490, uh, Daniel chapter 9. And Miller has 2,300 days, Daniel chapter 8. Interesting that everybody said 2,300 days and not, not the 2,520. And for those of us who like trapping us, 2,520 is not the longest and the last prophecy that's brought to view in the scriptures. We'll try and tackle that in one of our classes, it's just not. 
to 2300 days, despite what this movement in the past has tried to advocate. So now we come to our history. Before we come to our history, was Moses reliable? Partially, partially not. Is it easy to discern? No, because the sectarian position is the widely held position. You okay with that? Miller, is he a safe guide? Again, same issue. Partially yes, partially no. On certain points yes, certain points no. He holds to sectarian views. The problem is sectarianism is really big, so big that everyone's in the mess, so no one can see it. The problem is you can't step out and objectively observe what's going on, can you? That's the problem. It's a common theme in both the story of Miller, I say both in all three, of John and of Moses. We've got testimony of three now. So when we come to our own history, it should be relatively easy for us to see what the dynamics are and what the problems are and what the entrapment is. So what characteristics should we be looking for in our history? We've, we've mentioned a few now. So let's mention one. My brother, the t-shirt. Name one character, what, should, what characteristic or criteria do we need to consider in our own history? Can I raise this? When you go back to those three stories, now we're doing line upon line. We've picked up a number of threads, a number of concepts. I want to, I want to list them out that when we view our history, we should be able to see things. Now in each one of those three stories, are you able to have objectivity? What did we just say? Can you have objectivity? No? Yes or no? We said no. The reason you can't have objectivity is the people who are doing the analysis, where did they all live? In the sect. They're all in the sect. It's not one sect that believes one thing and you're out of that sect and you say, that's a sectarian view. Do you think it's a coincidence that Miller never had any sectarian agenda? Do you think that's a coincidence? We say, why, what's our story why he, why he didn't have a sectarian perspective? He was? Oh, no, he's, he's a deist. He's going to become a Christian. He's going to be converted. He's going to give his message. And he says, I never had a sectarian view. My message is for everybody. Why do we say that? What's our perspective? What's, what's, what? You know when you say, like, I want to give it a certain angle or spin, like a spin doctor. I don't know if you have that kind of concept. Why do we say, what spin do we want to put on that story? When we read about him. We want to say, he's a really nice man. Lovely Christian. Doesn't want to push his sectarian views on anybody. So he says, everyone's welcome into my camp meetings, my tent. Open to all. We, we put a positive spin on that, are we okay? I want to suggest what he does, he wants to cover his tracks, he wants to hide his erroneous views and not make it sectarian. He wants to say, I'm going to do something that's erroneous and every sect has that erroneous view. So it's hard to point out his error. We never give that version, but we could, because that's what's actually happening. It becomes virtually impossible to find out what his error is, because everyone is where? On the inside, you're not on the outside. We have three testimonies to that. When you come to our history, are we 
in the same mess? Yes or no? Okay, we're not in the same mess. It's easy to say yes, because upon testimony, there's two or three things established. But we have the ability to step out of that problem. What gives us the ability to do that? Sorry? The example? We have methodology. Methodology will give us the power to actually step out of this issue and observe things. Are we okay with that? The methodology that we have that allows us to do that is what? It's parable teaching. Parable teaching gives us the power to come out. And when you come out of that problem, you don't become part of the problem. Are we okay with that? Let me express it through a parable itself. Matthew 13, the parable of the tares. The story is about a field. And in that field, you have two things connected with that field. Hopefully we'll get the right answer. What are the two things that are connected to that field? Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, you have a story of a field. There are two things connected with that field. What are the two things that are connected to that field? The servants is one. And the plants. See how mature we are because we didn't say wheat and tears. So we didn't go down that trap. It's not wheat and tears, it's the servants and the plants. So the story is about the plants or the servants. If you go on quantity, which one's spoken about the most, what would your answer be? Servants. Check the verses. The servants are spoken of more than the plants are. But we know the story is about the plants. But the servants are connected with the field. So the problem, if you want to say it that way, is the plants. Do the plants have an awareness that there's something wrong? No, they, they don't. They're part of the problem. It's only the servants who are connected to the field, but they're outside of that issue that can clearly and objectively understand what the problem is. Can we see the relationship between plants and servants? Yeah? So it's parable teaching that gives us the ability to step out of this issue and make sure that we don't get into problems. Now, parable teachings have been around for a long time. They're in every one of those reform lines. Moses... Christ, Miller, and obviously ours. The problem is, when we first start our journey, do we know parables properly? We don't. If you don't know parables properly, what problem will you face? You can't get out of the problem. You remain in the problem. And if you remain in the problem, what is the problem? Sorry? You follow the creed because what can't you see? You can't see that there's a creed because everyone believes the same thing. Can we see that? So we're falling into the same problem as before, but now we have the ability to come out and objectively observe what's going on. You can see the similar concept in some of the other lines, but it's Perhaps not so easy. I would suggest if you go back to the story of Samuel Snow, does he do that? Does he step out of the problem? I would say yes. You can see the same in Christ. He steps out of the problem. They're too easy ones to see. I'm suggesting you could go to Moses and, and do the same, what, same thing. So, in our history... As I said, let's go back into those stories and see some points. What points do we want to bring up? What are the things that are going to connect our histories together? Well, I've seen a 
Someone else. Who said? Time. So we're going to address the issue of geography and we're going to address the issue of time. Another point. Sorry. Education. If you go back, it mentions specifically in each of those three stories the education of that person. Are we okay with that? In each one of those, John is the epitome of that issue that we say he was specially trained, specially educated. We already said that Moses was specially educated and we've discussed the issue, perhaps no, we haven't discussed the issue of Miller, but Miller was also educated. We could argue that he was self-educated. Self-educated is like John the Baptist who was, we, we use the phrase homeschooled. If you want to do it, he didn't go to the schools of the rabbis. Self-educated. So there's this issue of the creed. Anything else? No ideas? It's nothing new, it's everything that we've discussed in class. Someone says something? Sorry? The sect is the creed. Say that again? Of? So I'm going to go with um, literal or spiritual. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you meant. Creed is the belief, sect is the group. I'll put the word sect. So sect is the group, creed is what they believe. One more. We'll go with one more. There are, there, are, there are a number of them. Sister Joy? The. So I'm going to call that the person. The, the, the teacher or the messenger that's been selected. There's issues about them. Half right, half wrong. So we see that as a characteristic. Every one of these things we should be able to observe in our own history and try to come to terms with what those things mean, whether they mean something positive or negative and how we would deal with them. We have to understand, we have to understand ourselves at two levels. What are the two levels that we have to understand ourselves at or in? Sister Snyder. Two ways to understand who you are. In the line that you're currently in, you should be able to view yourself in two separate ways. No, they're the same person. They're the same thing. Priest is one. No. Priest is not going to be a good symbol because it doesn't give the contrast. Someone over here. My sister?
I missed the last bit, the most important bit. <laughs> I got the answer. She gave me the answer, but the, the interesting bit I missed. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, so that was the right answer. I don't know if we all heard that. Uh, Brother Robert, you had your hand up. So my sister said, you're either in the sect or you're out of the sect. What did she say in... What, is she, what was that in English? In, okay, so she said the same thing. So, you're either in or out. Brother Robert, you said? You're either the plant or the servant. Is that a case of Snyder? Yeah? You have to be one of the two. The plant is in the mess. I think someone said mess. You're in the mess or you're out of the mess. And when you're in the mess, you're just messed up. You can't see what the issue is. So, the person is going to show you things that are half right and half wrong. And this became a phenomena, a subject of controversy, last year. But it's been here since when? Since the time of the end, it's been here all the time, it's not anything new. So that should be able to give you confidence that what was being taught last year, what was being identified was correct because it was a confirmation of what has been here from the very beginning but did any of us know that it was already here? Why did we not know? Because we were part of the mess, we were the plants, we were inside so what changed from then, I'm going to say to now, now was last year, what changed? So it's not that we've become servants, because we were servants a long time ago, but now we've become aware. There's an awareness that we've become servants, or that we are servants. And how did that awareness come? Sister Jackie. By understanding parable teaching. We were using parable teaching a long time ago. Parable teaching is line upon line, it's just another way of expressing it. But now we've refined our understanding and with that refinement, a major development has happened. It's not a refinement, it's a major development, it is a refinement, but I mean it's not, it's not minor. It's a major development and the major development is that we can now come outside of the problem and we can identify this issue that Someone is half right and half wrong, and that someone is whom? Generically. The first angel or the first messenger, they have a consistent problem. Can we see that? Yeah? So if we really believed in line upon line, if we really believe that, like everyone says that they do, us and those who follow Future for America, is there anything here that anyone could disagree on? Because we just went to those stories in the same way that we've always taught them. I've not extracted anything unusual. I don't think I have. I know it's difficult because we're all part of a cliquey group now and we're all friends and we all want to you know, sustain each other. But think objectively. Think objectively, seriously, have we taken any of those histories and twisted them in a way that is not consistent to how we would have viewed them in the past? Moses, he has a prophecy that says, when you're born, you need to leave. Now, in case you don't have access to that prophecy, maybe you didn't have the books, what does God do? He gives them a second witness, which is what? Someone already gave the answer. Not his mother. The feeling is the mother, I'm going to say. What's his second witness that he carries all of his life? His name. What does his name mean? Answer carefully. Sister Snyder. Okay, so you haven't answered carefully because you added too much information. <laughs> so we have another go. 
take the water bit out. So it means to draw out. If you look at his name, it means to draw out. We always connect the water bit because of the Nile. But it means to draw out. So what was his job function? What, is the, what does it mean to draw out? It means to take out or come out. So his name says what? Come out of Egypt. That's what his name means. To, it doesn't, Egypt is not in his name. Come out of Egypt. If we're going to say come out of water, what is water a symbol of? The world. What is the symbol that we most often associate with the world? Egypt. So you can show that through symbology, but his, his name means to come out. The prophecy tells him that he's supposed to take the people out. He has all of this information. Is that an incorrect understanding? Is that an incorrect understanding of what's going on? Have we extended or stretched anything? Could someone who follows FFA sit in his class and say, we agree with that? Yeah? So, he forgets all of that. His military training kicks in and he wants to enter into civil war and he wants to remain in Egypt. All of this is wrong. You go to John the Baptist. John the Baptist wants to elicit civil war. People might say, we don't, let's not call it civil war because we're not all brethren. I get that. But we're all cohabiting. The Romans and the Jews in the same country. And the Jews want to remain in their country. They don't want to leave somewhere else. They don't want to escape. They want to kill the people who are oppressing them. So, he's got a problem. John the Baptist has got a problem. Very similar to Moses. It's all about taking control of the situation by force of arms. And he's wrong on that. It's all about geography. Is the kingdom of heaven on earth or in heaven? In heaven. Jesus says it's in your heart. He calls it the kingdom of grace. So again, that is nothing unusual. You go to Miller. He too has a time prophecy. He has a problem. Everyone holds on to that issue about geography, where the sanctuary is. And depending on where you think the sanctuary is, completely changes your message, turns it inside out, upside down, and now you're going to turn the, the, the final atonement of Christ into the second advent. So we can see all of that. So when we take all of that and bring it into our history here, all of those points we should be able to see. And this is where problems begin to arise. Because we can identify in 2019 that this person is half right and half wrong. And we say, oh, this is the first time it's ever happened. Therefore, the person has fallen. But they were half right and half wrong from the very beginning, weren't they? Yeah? Doesn't line upon line teach you that? So what were they half right and half wrong about? We had a question on this issue on Sabbath. What is this person half right and half wrong about? So to identify that, what you have to do is go back to the sect and the creed and find out what agreement this person has with the sect. He must have a common perspective or common understanding that the person holds with the sect that he got from the sect. So that's one thing that we'd have to do. Then we'd have to understand about their education, which is really connected to this, where they get their creed from. The education and the creed is essentially the same thing. That's how I would explain that. Then we have to understand the subject of time. And then we would have to understand the subject of geography. Now, when we come to the subject of time, we know that when you go to the Millerite history, even though there's some apparent acceptance, some emotional response to the subject of time, 
Does the sect, does the church really believe in the issue of time? They don't. This is a new phenomena. They don't accept the time. And how do we know that? Just a simple way to say that is that the unsealing of the book of Daniel was what? It was the message of Daniel 8.14 in relation to time. It's a brand new phenomena, brand new issue that has never confronted the church before. And even though at first they kind of warm up to it, when he says in 25 years all these people begin to gather, they soon waver on this issue. So there's not a proper acceptance of time. You go to the story of John. Alan White's clear. She says if they had understood the time in which they live, they would have been better prepared to accept the message of John and Jesus. So there's a level of rejection of time even in that history. And then you go back to the story of Moses and again you can argue the same subject, the same issue. Part of the problem in the first two stories is what? How do we mark the beginning in those two lines? By? By the birth. Is the birth marking the prophecy? The time prophecy, the time. It's not. The, the birth and the timing are disconnected in both stories. And in the story of Moses, it's really bad because it's 80 years between the birth and the prophecy that's connected to time. And you work out how many generations you can fit into 80 years. It's a couple at least. If you're a, a person, a mature person, if you're the mother of Moses here at the birth, you may not be around when the fulfilment of the prophecy comes in. Same problem in the story of John. The birth is not marking 27, 31, 34. They're out of sync. So it becomes really difficult for the church to even entertain this subject of time. So we've addressed these issues and then it comes to the subject of geography. So when we come to our history, the person's half right and half wrong, what are they half right on? Even though they're scared to say it in a definitive way. What are they half right on? They're half right on time. And what are they half wrong on? Geography. So they're right on time, wrong on geography. We have three witnesses to this. So this is what we should observe in our own story, in our own line. So it becomes a relatively easy task. And I'm not sure why people don't see this if you remain in the movement this long. And what I don't, I don't mean just us, I mean those people who followed Future for America. If you stayed into, if you stayed this long in the movement up to September 2019, why you can't see this methodology? Now I'm not saying this was brought up in this fashion, I'm saying this clarity, if people see this as clarity, back then, Bryce, I think it was introduced into the movement way back in the spring of 2019 when Half Right and Half Wrong came. People misunderstood that. What did they see it as? A slanderous attack upon the leader of the movement. Isn't that how they saw it? It was not that. This was uh, the voice of God speaking to his people saying what? We're going to formalise the concept of half right and half wrong. It's going to become an issue that's going to test us. Everyone. Because it's been here for a long time. Hopefully we can see that perspective. The subject comes up again in the summer and then its culmination comes in September last year with those people who are unwilling to understand what this issue is about walk away from the movement. And now we're We've come full circle and we're still explaining this issue. So the issue of time is half right, sorry, is correct. And the issue of geography is wrong. So 
We're just going to finish the class. We just want to reiterate what I said a moment ago. We have two issues here. We'll wait a moment for people to uh, relocate. So we've gone through these points that we've listed out from these previous lines and the focus of our attention is on the message. It has two components, time and geography. They're the phrases or the words that I've chosen to use. Time is an easy one to see, but I've chosen to call the second one, the second issue, geography. And I've explained why in each of the histories you can see a subject of geography going all the way through. Those three. But in each of those stories, we would tend not to call it the subject geography. In Moses, we'd call it the Exodus. That would be that line. For Christ, it would be the Gospel. And for Miller, it would be the Second Advent. I would think that they would be the defining titles or issues for those generations those dispensations, those lines. So I asked what was our one? And someone says, the Sunday law. And I asked, is there another one that we would define as being the theme or the concept of our reform line? I don't want to say 144,000 because that's the title of the group. So don't say 144,000. Okay, so my brother says equality. Anyone else? So I'm happy with the Sunday law, but I'm going to put a synonym with that. Close of probation. So this is, I'm suggesting, the theme for our dispensation. So when we say geography, geography is a, a symbol or a word that I'm using instead, instead of the Sunday law or close of probation. So if you were to take that information and put that through, before I just finish that point, my brother said equality. So I don't know if you all heard that. I don't know if you can see why he is wrong to say it's equality, that that's the title that should be there. Let me suggest. Whatever should be here, should it be a correct idea or an incorrect idea? Something that's right or something that's wrong, a mistake or something that's correct? It should be something that's incorrect because it's wrong. Yeah? Now, is the subject of equality correct or incorrect? It's correct. So it, it would not fit the criteria to put equality here. There has to be something that's in the message that's wrong. We can see that. So the subject of equality is the correction of an existing mistake. So what we're trying to look for is the thing that's wrong. Now, what's Moses' problem? It's on the board. What's Moses' problem? The Exodus is his problem. What's John's problem? What is the definition of gospel? Simple one. Simple definition of gospel. If you go back to Genesis, 
What does the gospel look like? I will put... What's enmity? Another word for enmity. Hatred. What do you do with people you hate? You fight with them, don't you? Yeah? So, here it is. The gospel, they don't understand how you're going to fight with your enemies. How you're going to escape from them. So, we come to Miller. What's his mistake? Second Advent. He's mistaking the Second Advent with the opening up of the judgment. You know, I didn't contrive this. I didn't, in my room yesterday, plan, how can I get everybody to see that there's no real Sunday law and trap or trick everybody? This is why I'm saying we need to be objective to see, is all this accurate? Have I accurately given titles here that everybody would say are reasonable? Our message from the very beginning has been what? The time... For the Sunday law, the close of probation for God's church is here. You should be afraid, you should be scared, and get ready. That's what our message has been. You go back to each one of those, it's the same story all the way through. And they're the, I'm saying they're the correct titles for those ones. I didn't even guess them. Just taking them straight from inspiration. This one you can't get from inspiration because this is one that we are manufactured. These are ones that we came up with. But it's the one that the movement has taught. Go to the magazine, Time of the End. What are we saying in that magazine? It's the time? For what? For verse 41 to be fulfilled. Leading on to Daniel 12.1. It's all about verse 41, that book, isn't it? All the other verses, they're just extra details. Verse 40 tells you how to get to verse 41 and verse 42 to 45 tell you what? What's going to happen? Not next. In verse 41. Verse 40 leads you to verse 41 and the other verses tell you what's going to happen in the history of verse 41. It's repeat and enlarge the last verses. If we're okay with that. It's all about the Sunday law. So if you just take this, if you were to just use common sense, rule number two. What have we got half wrong? What, in our message, what is this that's half wrong? It's the subject of the Sunday law. To close the probation. This is the mistake that's been in our movement from its very inception. This is not an attack on someone. This is not against inspiration. This is line upon line methodology. And people will say, well, that stands in opposition, as the questioner did um, on Sabbath. This stands against all those inspired quotes, putting your salvation in peril if we were to hold on to this. So the question is, and we used to frame it in the following way, do you either believe inspiration or you believe the lines? People accuse us of that, of saying that, and I say, okay, we'll go with that accusation. Which one wins, which one trumps? Which one do we be guided by? The line or the word? Those statements, those paragraphs, those verses, which one are you prepared to be guided by? Lines, we say the lines, but that, when we say lines, that's an intelligent answer to an intelligent question, if you're prepared to see it. Because what is the question really asking? Luke chapter 10, verse 26. And thus saith the Lord, how do you read? And do any of us know how to read? No, because we're Pharisees, we're lawyers. We're doctors of the law. We don't know how to read. We need to be trained. We need to be educated in how to read. And when you learn how to read, 
then you begin to see what is the help or the rule that you have. Line upon line. So it's the line upon line methodology that is the tool that will help you to understand those passages. You cannot approach them, you dare not approach them without line upon line. So if people want to accuse us, and we say, okay, accuse us if you want to, choose one or the other, line or inspiration, and we say, well, we'll choose line. What we're saying is, by the way, what is a line? It's a structured, what? Statement. It's a structured verse, isn't it? You've got a verse on its own, and then you've got a structured verse. That's what a line is. Because if you do a line, any line, this line here, this is a, a line of prophecy, we would call it, or is it a line of history? Which one? Because they're different. Why is it not a line of history? What makes it a line of prophecy rather than a line of history? What's the difference between them? Because 2019 is a historical date and it's a prophetic date. What makes it prophetic? What do we say? We say an inspired statement was fulfilled at this date. That's what makes it prophetic. So that inspired statement was found where? In an unstructured book, if I could, if I could dare say it that way. It was just a verse that was found in here. We take that verse out, put it onto a historical line, and then that way mark becomes prophetic. So when we say lines, trump inspiration what we mean is a line is a structured inspired statement as opposed to something that is unstructured and you dare not rely upon unstructured quotes because you don't know what order to put them in they don't make any sense so that's what we mean when we say the lines trump inspiration or a verse or a spirit of prophecy quote it's because what we say is a spirit prophecy quote on its own, just on a piece of paper, is no good. You have to get that piece of paper and do what with it? Put it onto a historical line and you need to know where to put it. If you put it in the right place, then the line, the structured statement, is better than what? The unstructured statement. We can see that. So... If you could see all of this, and I, what I don't understand is why those people who follow Future for America cannot see, I can't even understand why Future for America can't see this. I mean, it's clear, if you take a structured approach, what are they now doing? They're wrong. What, what is the wrong thing to do? The right thing to do is take a structured approach, and now they're taking an Unstructured, what do, what do Adventists call an unstructured approach? A thus saith the Lord. No context, no structure, nothing. We need to be absolutely clear on that. All of us do. Those who are following Future for America, they should be aware of what's happening. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of innuendo and rhetoric that's spoken, but this is... The simple reality, you take line upon line, you take the three histories, you see that they're all wrong. The first messenger is always half wrong from the very inception of their message. Therefore, we should expect to see it in our history. And do we? Yes. We see it now in 2019. It becomes a repeating theme, a repeating concept because it gets formalised there. And at the same time we can see it theologically like this, structurally, we can also see it in the world. You can already see in the world what this issue of the mark of the beast or the Sunday law really looks like. 
So we have multiple lines of evidence, but the primary one, the simple one, is the one that we've discussed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, help each of us to be able to conceptualise and internalise these thoughts and ideas. They're not new, but they may be a new revelation because we may not have seen them in quite the same way. Help us to understand the real story behind these facts, the real prophetic significance of statements that we read. Lord, we ask for a continued blessing upon us in Jesus' name.